Sybil was the, she was inspirational, not only to me, but just to everyone that she met. Sybil was kind of like Norm. Cheers. You know, you walk in with everybody. Oh, there's Sybil. Everybody knew Sybil. That's because Sybil knocked on everybody's door. We all were very influenced by, you know, what um, Sybil, you know, how she was a leader and um, I think made us much stronger, you know. In 1954, a young teacher approached Joe Donovan, the superintendent of schools in De Pere, Wisconsin, looking for a teaching position. This young educator was Sybil Hopp. He gave her the task of creating a program for the special needs students in the district, a task which at that time was almost unheard of. Mr. Joe Donovan felt there, sh there was such a need for a, a teacher, a program for children that could not function in the regular school. And he identified her as the person to be, it, be that person. Uh, and so it was really Joe, Mr. Joe Donovan and Sybil that jointly began this program. I think she was very persistent. She would get people involved. She would get them committed. And she basically, and again, all while being very civil and cordial, you know, um, she just organized a lot. I think you're right. I think that, that, that whole tone, that whole idea of the way she operated is still part of that school. It's still, you know, it's, it's part of the impetus for it. And I think that's what makes it different than she knew how to sell the program. Yeah. You know, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. county, we still do it today, you know, putting up the tree at the county courthouse, you know, downtown in the county exec building and stuff. Well, that was civil, that goes back yeah. to, to civil's days, you know. And she knew that that was good PR, you know, for a county exec to sitting there with a little Downs kid putting an ornament on a tree or whatever. And, you know, and she knew how to melt that. And, and she knew that that would pay for itself. Not personally, but funding for her kids in the programs and stuff. She kept the focus on. Yeah, she kept like, the don't, focus don't on the program. How about yeah. us? We're yeah. here yeah. without having to say it that way. Yeah, she was just you know endless energy. Um, if you look at the picture, you know her painting. You know that big smile. Always wore that smile. You know, just very, very upbeat. You know, when I when I think of her, I just picture her with that big smile because that's what she wore all the time. You know. She went door to door and encouraged parents to allow her to teach their children, kids that had not had any, were not allowed, you know, there was no program for them. So she initiated that and because of her love of kids, I mean, it just became contagious and the school just started from a few students to what it is today, which is wonderful. Stand, oh, stand is an S word. That had to be hard work for her to go in there and some of these people, you know, I need to convince you to let your kid in my program and, whoa. I can remember her going out, especially when I was real young, when I was like a sophomore in college when I first met her. She talked about, you know, visiting homes where there were kids that were eight, nine years old, haven't even been in school yet, you know, because of them being you know, more involved. Um, you know, what she wanted was for all special ed need, you know, children to be in a public, you know, school setting and being provide pro, uh, appropriate programming. Sometimes the parents were reluctant that Sybil knocked on doors to find some of these kids because, like I said, these kids weren't out in the public. And so she narrowed them down, knocked on doors and tried to find them. They said, well, that's so far away and blah, blah, blah and stuff that, you know, I can't, we don't do that and stuff. She'd always have that positive comment to keep that child going and a great, great support person for parents who were almost at that point, at some point I felt almost shunned. You know, their children were just kind of kept behind closed doors and that was not 
not the what she felt at all. She felt they needed to be out and about and have an opportunity to live as any other person. It's the rights of the person. The kids, we went to a, uh, for lunch and there was a group of kids that never used a pop machine before in their life. And so I remember going into a bank, I think, uh, I think Chris Sinkle was along with us whenever. Anyways, but I went into a bank and got a roll of quarters, a couple rolls of quarters, and we made the kids use a pop machine. And a lot of them, for the first time ever, it was the first time that they ever used a pop machine. So it was real living experiences. We tried to do a lot of those things because a lot of those kids never had that opportunity before. And they were just, you know, the quotation that they were dumb kids or whatever, and they're in the back of the woods, and they never were allowed to come out in those situations. So a lot of those times we got the kids out and we did a lot of things with them that uh, that they probably never would have had before. We were young. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was that was a big thing too, you know. Back She then, had a really young staff. It, we were extremely young. At one time... At that school. Yeah, yeah. That, at Donovan, that, that, it was an older Hop, staff. staff yeah. At Civil Hop, we were an extremely young staff. Median age must have been like 24. I was in college and I was doing a, just a visit up here from Oshkosh up here. And um, the gentleman that, he was a county employee, was taking us around to some of the county schools. and. Uh, Donovan School had just been created probably two years prior to that. They had just built Donovan. And um, I didn't know what special ed was back then. I was a regular ed uh, major. And we walked into this, uh, Donovan School, and Sybil was the principal at that time, but she was also a working uh, teaching principal. So I was her aide, and I functioned I traveled within the building to different classrooms. It was my first introduction to special education and I quit every day for two weeks. I just felt it was not the position for me and I would go to Sybil and I'd say, you know, this isn't for me. I just feel I need this whatever. And she would encourage me to just hang in there. She said, always would say, you're going to love my kids. Uh, which indeed is what I ended up doing. So anyway, we walked into um, Sybil's classroom and um, there was a rather large Down syndrome girl in there that jumped up. Back then I wore a, a tie and coat and I had a red tie on. And she jumped out of her seat and came over and grabbed my tie and saying, oh, pretty, pretty. And I backed out of that room. I was in the hallway against the um, lockers. My, fed, my face was as red as the um, tie was. I like, what type of children are these? You know, I just, you know, and Sybil came out and she said, oh, Linda, you know, we shake hands with our new friends, you know, and she introduced herself to, to me and my, the guy I was with and um, brought us into the room. That's my first experience, you know, meeting Sybil, you know, and um, we spent probably an hour or two in that room. And by the time I was done, I felt very comfortable, you know, with the population and, um, and Sybil. I mean, you know, she just was the type of person that, um, you know, had an excellent rapport, you know, with anyone she met, you know. I had an elderly nun that got me into special education and, and her favorite saying was that when it came to special ed kids, and, and I told this to Sybil one time too, and she, and she smiled and she said, yeah, anybody can feel sorry for these kids and have sympathy for them, but you're here to teach them. And I think that was Sybil's, uh, Sybil's thing too. We would take them for overnights. Oh, We'd have to Chicago. <laughs> How many kids would we have sleeping overnight? It was incredible. Seventy suckers at the Brewer game. Yeah. Sybil, you know, she would have pajama parties at her house, you know, bring the kids out there. You know, her whole life was really just dedicated to, um, you know, this population.
She also kept the parents very involved. Oh yeah. Um, that's a there's a huge parent network over there, and um, that's what I think kept that school open in the days when they were trying to close it down. Those parents were not going to let that school close, and that was part of part of Sybil's involvement um, way back when is getting those parents involved, making the parents realize that their child was valued and that they need to needed to be a big part of that that child's education as well as coming to school every day. There was a lot of fighting going on and there was and, and I'm not suggesting that mainstreaming itself was bad. It was the my my problem always has been with the total application of we're gonna mainstream everybody. Hey let's just you know it's it's a great idea, let's just do it for everybody, right? The population um, started to go down considerably where we opened up more and more classrooms in the in the seven districts that we served where the population here at Hop, um, you know, dropped probably 50% of the population was mainstream. But there were still a lot of parents who um, wanted their, you know, child in a separate facility. Well, and it was also the trend yeah. because the right. school, there oh, was also a segregated facility in Manitowoc called Riverside. Riverside? Riverview. 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 And Riverview ended up closing. And we were one of the last, last holes. <laughs> <With> a dinosaur, <laughs> you know? yeah, it and still it is a dinosaur. Still one. And Top they, one the they wanted to close us, and that's when this parent, the parent strength, the parent group came in and said, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, we like what's going on here. You're not going to close our school." And they were a big part of the fight. I remember being at a meeting where somebody said, "We're going to put these, uh, these CD kids out, you know, it's MR kids, in your regular classroom." And I, I remember seeing horror in some of the teachers' eyes. Like, well, you can't have that. Are you kidding? We had to close Donovan School because the numbers were so low over here. You know, half, less than half the rooms were being utilized. And um, so we moved, and this was quite controversial back then and when they closed Donovan School because uh, people thought that we were going to lose program. The issue wasn't mainstreaming so much. The issue was let's close these schools and put them in all in public schools because that's, it's good. Well, it wasn't good. Appropriate is putting him in a class where he can function at his level and have some success. So uh, that would have been the end of it that Sybil would have been on. And I think that's the end of it we've stayed on and we've fought to stay on. And this gal was uh, very concerned about her son and, uh, and, and the mainstreaming and putting him in regular classes. And, and when she found out that he could actually be in a class where he wouldn't be the, the lowest kid on the totem pole, where he'd actually be around other kids that he could function with on the same level and have friends, real friends, not just peers. She was delighted. And when he left our program, uh, and, and well, actually he didn't leave the program, she fought to keep him in, but he was all set to go into a high school program and they wanted him in the regular high school setting and, and where he would have special ed classes and regular classes and she fought that tooth and nail and I, I supported her. Uh, they finally backed down. And she was in tears. It was like, thank God he can be with other kids. It finally came with, to a know. point where I remember going out to the airport and picking up a guy from Washington, D.C., from the Office of Civil Rights. Okay. And had to take him out to dinner. And um, he talked to me, asked me some questions. And he interviewed people over at the school for almost a week. Mm -hmm. And that could have been it. And if he chose that we were violating those kids' civil rights by having them in a segregated facility is what the bottom line was. And he left happy and impressed and really never heard anything more about it after that. Her smile would be twice as large if, it, if that were possible. Um, yeah, she would just be floating on air. It, I mean, it's her dream. The school has accomplished her dream. Um, it's, yeah, it's a legacy. And yeah. When I go around the community in conversation with people, I say I worked at Civil Hop School, they've all heard of it. You know, we've continued to excel, you know, as far as our programming. Um, you know, you look at the vocational training program that we have here at HOP, it's 
you know, second to none, you know, so I'm sure Sybil would be extremely proud there. You know, we still do the camp program that Sybil started. We've worked hard to keep a lot of things that Sybil started in place um, and to expand, you know, with them. It's been really nice for me to see her dreams come true because she always had hoped um, to have a full camp program for our kids, to have a swimming program for our kids, and to think we now have a pool within the school. Those were all long, long range dreams that, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to watch this happen. I think she'd be real proud of it uh, because it's so unique. Um, these parents love that place and the kids are getting what they need, and it is. It's just unique. I think she'd be real happy. In all the, in all of education, I don't. I don't. I've never heard heard anybody say a bad word about her. Well, so. and not only that, she's pretty unique. If I hadn't, uh, you know, met her, you know, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> she made people feel good about doing things for kids. She had that. She had that personality that. You know, it wasn't, you're not doing it for me, it's doing it for the kids. You know, Joe interviewed and, you know, had the right qualities and that he felt would work and, yeah, I, I don't know, the, the rest is history, I guess.